Hello everyone, this is Dr. Pruitt. Welcome to this week's EKG. Our first case we're going to start with today is a 25-year-old male with no past medical history whatsoever who calls 911 having feelings like his heart is racing because he just used cocaine earlier in the evening. We start with our set of vital signs. Looks like his heart rate is 212. No wonder he's feeling like his heart is racing. His blood pressure is 128 over 82 with an oxygen saturation of 98% and a relatively normal blood glucose level. So, so far, only abnormal vital sign is his heart rate, um, which is also his chief complaint. So we jump quickly into our 12 lead, and this is what you see. Here's a good look at it if you want to pause it and take a look and figure it out for yourself. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and move on. Like the same way we do every time, we'll start with the rate. Uh, the computer's telling me that his heart is going 206 beats a minute, which is incredibly fast. Um, and I want to confirm that with my eyes. So I'm looking for a QRS complex that lines up with a thick red line. I see one right here and we go 300, 150, so he's somewhere between 150 and 300, um, probably 200, so I would agree with the computer, incredibly fast rate, um, agree with 206. So next we move on to our rhythm. There's two questions we ask with rhythm. Is there a P wave before every QRS? That's our first question, and my favorite place to look is lead two for P waves. I'm not convinced that I do see any P waves in this rhythm. Uh, across the precordium, I don't see any either, so I'm going to say there's no P waves. Next question is, is this regular or is this irregular? To the naked eye, uh, I don't see any big gaps or smaller gaps to suggest irregularity in the QRS complexes. Looks like it's beating pretty regularly to me. Now, the faster the rate gets, the harder it is to determine whether it's irregular or not, and this is an incredibly fast rhythm, but it does look regular. And then when we start to look at our axis, again, we look in leads one and leads AVF. Lead one is our left thumb. I think the majority of the QRS vector here is positive, so we'll say that's good. Lead AVF, remember that's our right thumb. Very clearly positive in AVF. I would call this a normal axis. Moving on to our intervals. This is where we let the computer do the work for us. First thing we look at is our QRS. Um, anything less than 120 is normal. This one is 78, so this is a narrow complex QRS, which is good. And then our QTC is actually 501. This is high, this is long. Um, so we have a long QT with a narrow QRS. And then looking at our ST segments, I do see some depression. I tend to read these the same way every time. So I start in 2, 3 AVF, looking kind of at the inferior leads. And what I see here, I do see some maybe suggestion, inverted T waves, suggestion of ST depression here. Moving up to 1 in AVL as I'm looking at the high lateral leads. Not necessarily depression there, but I don't love the way those T waves look. And then as I move to the septal and anterior leads, I do see some ST depression kind of continuing throughout the precordium. That ST segment has dropped below the baseline in most of those. And so I would call this diffuse ST depression. I don't see any elevations, any reciprocal changes to suggest that this is a STEMI, but I do note that there may be um, some suggestion of ischemia there. And I would think this is probably just based on the rate. So as we are asked to interpret this 12 lead, what is this rhythm? We have a tachycardic rhythm with a rate of 206 that is a regular supraventricular tachycardia with a normal axis and a prolonged QT. This is also known as SVT, supraventricular tachycardic. It's a fast, narrow, regular tachycardia with no P waves. That's how we know it's SVT. And when we look into this a little bit deeper, um, if it all comes down to your QRS, remember you want this to be less than 120. And if this complex right here is nice and narrow, you know that it's coming from above the ventricles. That impulse is coming maybe not from the sinoatrial node because we don't have P waves, 
but we know that it's coming from above here because the QRS is nice and narrow. It's not taking a long time to depolarize the ventricles and it's above the ventricles. That's why we call supraventricular tachycardia as opposed to our wide complex tachycardias where we look at the QRS and it's maybe greater than 120. We know that those are probably originating from below the AV node. Now this is not always the case. There may be an exception for someone may have an impulse coming from above, but they also have a left bundle branch block. We won't get into these complicated cases today. In general, if it's a narrow complex tachycardia, it's coming from above the ventricles. If it's wide complex, you can be suspicious that it could be originating a little bit lower than that. Um, and here's just another way to look at our tachycardias. Narrow complex QRS, um, they can either be regular or irregular. We have a regular rhythm here today. And there's two options here, really keeping it simple for us. Is it sinus tachycardia or is it SVT? The difference between the two is sinus tachycardia is originating from the sinoatrial node, which will give you a P wave. Since we don't have P waves, but we do have a regular rhythm with a narrow QRS, we're looking at SVT. And SVT is not uncommon in cocaine overdoses. Cocaine can act as a sodium channel blocker and can actually um, prolong that QTC with some of its other actions on potassium repolarization as well. Um, but cocaine can cause SVT, and that's probably what happened in this case. And so if we were to treat this gentleman, first thing you can do is Valsalva maneuvers. Uh, basic can do this. Um, basically have increased intrathoracic pressure exhale against a closed glottis. You can push on a syringe here like this gentleman's doing and then raise the legs. This was a trial that was done and shown to be very effective. The newest way to do this that seems to be the most effective for a Valsalva maneuver is to have your patient exhale, plug their nose, and then have them inhale against a plugged nose. And that was a, a trial that was just released in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine last March that had a very high success rate. So I'm anxious to try this on one of my patients. Haven't had a chance yet, but I keep watching for an opportunity. Um, if that doesn't work, you can always do adenosine, and if your patient's unstable, you can consider a cardioversion. Really what you're going to do here is just reset this AV node. In supraventricular tachycardia with rates over 200, what's happening is just um, there is a cycle of basically depolarization that's happening that's not regulated by the sinoatrial node. We need to stop that electrical discharge, reset the AV node, and that's usually very effective. And that is all I have for you today. That was our case, supraventricular tachycardia. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.